Darktide has gone through a lot over the years. I made a video around launch expressing my overall disappointment that, while it was a fantastic game at its core, it lacked so much over Vermintide 2 content-wise that I just wasn't enjoying it very much. Times have changed, however, and as predicted by Fat Shark's history, they would come back after releasing the console ports and smash it out of the park. Currently, Darktide has improved to the point where I actually enjoy it more over Vermintide 2. I actually would have had this video out sooner, but I couldn't stop playing the game while working on it. To get a frame of reference for how drastic the changes compared to the launch were, I'll do a quick rundown. This won't cover everything. Entire mechanics, like the crafting system, weren't there on launch. Things that were in Vermintide 2, like the Chaos Spawn and Potions, had to get added later, and the game drastically lacked class variety and balance. And while it took some time, there were so many drastic changes and overhauls that I would finally consider this game content complete. Save for some promised features that may or may not still be coming, such as the complex weapon crafting system that you can technically get access to with a mod. But as for what the game is, Darktide is a hybrid melee horde shooter where you get dropped into a mission, are expected to scavenge for resources that will later be used in crafting when the mission is done, and move forward to complete the objective. Standing in your way are hordes of Nurgle warshippers who range from freshly infected grunts, who fall over from a wayward ogre fart, to massive armored-clad horrors wielding a twin-linked Browning M2 that's been snorting chaos crack. A major change from the previous game of Vermintide is that enemies are now more regularly armed with guns, and the entire game is built to facilitate differentiating range threats and melee ones. When it comes to melee, the way it controls is virtually unchanged. You have a block that will protect you in every direction, with attacks you aren't looking at consuming more stamina, a push to create space by staggering everything in front of you that is susceptible to such a stagger. You are also given a dodge that grants you a grace period from enemy tracking for the duration of the dodge and a short period after, and when it comes to melee attacks, every weapon has a set of light and heavy combo chains, but depending on how you use either attack, it can influence what your next attack is. For example, this sword starts with a sweeping heavy that is better at hitting multiple enemies than the poke of the light attack its combo starts with. If I were to start with the heavy attack and then follow up with multiple light attacks, I would end up chaining sweeping attacks to hit multiple enemies in a horde. Then, after that, I can do another heavy attack to basically reset the combo by going back to the heavy sweeping attack. Alternatively, if I want more damage, I can do the light attack first for the massive damage poke, and then follow up with a heavy attack for another poke, giving me a huge amount of burst damage to just one enemy. But, unlike prior games, actions have more commitment. You can't instantly cancel out of weapon swings, and swapping to guns is an instant. So, swap speed is a huge bonus on weapons, and tactics like block cancelling to reset combos doesn't exist as much. And that's what I enjoy the most about this style of combat. It's about finding the weapon you like the versatility and specialization of, and abusing the combo paths to do what you want. A weapon that has maybe one or two single target hits with the rest being low damage sweeps can still end up being a very solid single target weapon if you use your combos correctly. Then, once you have have your combos understood, you work on your dodge game to where you feel like you're just dodging hundreds of enemies at once on pure instinct. The gun mechanics are very standard. The only things that are different to it, compared to most shooters, is how it handles recoil. For the most part, recoil isn't how much it bobs your entire screen, but instead the way it displaces your weapon. However, there is one mechanic to them that can make a big difference. Suppression. This is a mechanic where any non-special or non-shotgun type enemy can essentially be staggered at range if you shoot near them. The amount varies based on the gun, where some just can't suppress basic enemies, but if you have a gun that specializes in suppression, it allows you to just open fire on anything actively shooting at you to stop them from firing for a few seconds, giving you valuable time to reposition or kill them. But, above all else, this game just feels and sounds incredible. Fat Shark always had amazing sound design, but this is next level. If any game can make a bolter sound better than Dark Tide, I will be truly impressed. Oh, and it goes without saying, but Jesper Kid absolutely fucks this soundtrack. After that piece, I'm pretty sure he's not allowed within 5 miles of any church's pipe organ. Overall, this game was designed to be much slower than Vermintide in terms of how fast everything dies and how fluidly you control your character. Everything is less instant and snappy, but in a way that changes the flow without making it feel unresponsive. 
In the same vein as the delay on blocking, another major shift from Vermintide is that stamina regen pauses when you dodge. This is actually massive. It means if you're out of stamina and in a tight spot, it becomes exponentially harder to survive. In previous games, you could dodge back and forth spamming push in the hope you clear enough space to survive and get a nasty clutch off. But in Dark Tide, you are much more strictly limited to the amount of actions you can perform during combat unless you play your cards very well and create space to regenerate stamina. Another change along these lines is the reworked temporary health system. Rather than being health that decays, allowing you to absorb a hit every now and then, they create an entirely new system to work its way into the game a lot smoother. It's so much more complicated, but it works perfectly for the style of combat they want this game to have. Temporary health was, overall, pretty feast or famine. This system, on the other hand, allows for repeated mistakes in a short time to destroy you, but also for single mistakes to pile up. Toughness in Dark Tide works as follows. It's a meter that regenerates over time, but only if you're within a radius of another player known as Coherency. Not only does it regenerate toughness, but it grants a buff that each class has. The regen barely matters for melee combat, but can be invaluable for drawn out ranged fights. This is because toughness works differently depending on the damage source. For melee attacks, whatever percent of toughness you have is how much the hit gets blocked. If you're at full toughness, getting hit by a melee attack that doesn't do enough damage to bypass toughness will result in the hit being fully absorbed. If you have 99% toughness, 1% of the damage taken will go to your HP. This means mistakes in melee still cascade because without any toughness, enemies deal a ton of damage to you, but you can still eat a hit or two with minimal problem. How it works with ranged weapons is that toughness always fully absorbs the hit, and any overflow damage once it's broken is then sent to health. This means with enough toughness regeneration, you can tank an entire firing squad with little worry of chip damage, at least from gunners. Since you're now at less toughness, any melee hit will be felt. I absolutely love what they did with this system. Is it a little unintuitive? abso fucking lootly. However, the dynamic it creates is amazing. You can't ignore melee enemies to shoot ranged enemies, because if they hit you, you just run the risk of taking chip damage just to deal with a couple gunners. But also, if you stay in the open, you risk your toughness getting constantly depleted, leaving you open to taking occasional chip damage from melee attacks. Positioning and how you handle volleys of ranged enemies matters just as much as your ability to engage lots of dangerous enemies in melee. As such, the enemy roster just feels way Way more involved. The structure is the same. Grunts of varying thickness, elites who try to lock you down or delete you, and specials. But with the inclusion of ranged chaff and ranged elites on top of all this, it becomes a lot more interesting. Normal melee grunts just exist to be the thing that deletes you if you fuck up during a horde. Put your guard down for one second to shoot that old gunner or elite, you risk getting hit by five enemies at once and losing half your health. The only unique enemy among them are these pox walkers. It doesn't say it anywhere, but a quarter of the damage they deal is dealt as corruption damage, which makes that part of your health uncorruptible. The weak hordelings are the ocean you can drown in, while the elites and specials are the icebergs coming at you at Mach 10. These elites are there to either fuck you up or lock Lock you down. Rangers are somewhat beefy, but mostly just hard to stagger as they more or less infinitely combo you. Unlike Pyre games, you can at least do something about it, since backstepping and whooping at your gun works. Bulwarks just completely absorb hits, and while they don't do a ton of damage, if one's targeting you, you basically can't engage with anything else unless you stagger his shield away and kill him safe for a few weapons that bypass shields. Maulers and Crushers are on the much tankier side, and are meant to burst you down while blocking bullets from everything running up. This is largely due to their overhead attack that will one-shot basically everything in the game and can't be blocked without specific weapons. The specialists are there to put your team at a disadvantage against hordes and elites. The trapper and mutant are the two displacement enemies. Mutants will just bowl through anything, knocking them over, to grab one specific person before slamming them into the ground, usually fully breaking their toughness, and throwing them in a random direction. Due to their tankiness and speed, they could be a huge pain if you lack good damage specifically for them, and when there's multiple about, it makes revives near impossible until they are dead. Trappers instead instantly pull you while disabling you completely and being a lot more quiet than mutants. These guys are honestly one of the most dangerous specialists because they can grab you from quite far away and through any amount of enemies, meaning those bulwarks that have a collective density of a 5 foot wall of depleted uranium will almost guarantee you die if you get grabbed by a trapper through them. Poxhounds are a disabler similar to the trapper but are overall much easier to deal with. Louder, they get knocked back by any friendly fire, 
And due to a long history of their bugginess, if you push during their pounce windup animation, they get staggered no matter how far away you are from them. Bombers and Flamers are area deniers, where they just fill the room with a huge amount of AoE fire that has ramping damage and makes reviving impossible. Flamers are simple, since they need line of sight and are fairly close range. But Bombers can not only chuck their grenades with the tiniest needle, even if they're slightly out of sight, but their cooldown is lower than the duration of the flames. If you can't see these guys, get out of sight immediately. Lastly, you got Pox Bursters. These guys are either really easy to deal with or fuck you up so much. Once they get near you, they leap and explode, but they also explode if they die by anything. Once near, your only option is to push them away and dodge back to get out of the blast radius. Since they're loud, it's easy to deal with them. But the problem comes in when they appear in staggered packs or with other specials. Sometimes you gotta make the decision to either push them or eat some hits you're blocking from a rager. Worst part is, they deal so much corruption damage it's actually possible to die completely without going down once. Then we go on to the ranged enemies. They're about what you expect. They stay much further away, give a tiny static sound and a light flash when they're about to shoot you, and fire in small bursts. Problem is, in every instance, there is a metric fuckload of them. Then there's elite range enemies with the Gunner and Reaper who exist to suppress the fuck out of you and shred your HP. Reapers especially because they do reduce damage to toughness, but once it breaks, your health evaporates. Shotgunners are the opposite. They do a lot of health damage, yes, but their toughness damage multiplier is through the roof. Lastly, there are also snipers, essentially the shotgunner but with even more damage and often stay much further away. Between those last two elites, you will hear their wind-up noises in your sleep. Sorry if that made you instinctively try and dodge in whatever game you're playing. The upside of dealing with ranged enemies is that if you get near them, they pull out their weak melee and run at you. It's jank, and sometimes they don't, but in a pinch, it's safer to run at them if you can than to try and run away and get peppered. Not counting reapers or gunners, they just keep firing until fuck you. And oh god, let's not forget about the bosses. Overall, not bad on their own. These guys just exist to make your life hell if you're already dealing with shit. The only ones of note that really deviate from this is the demon host. These guys just sit in place waiting for someone to trigger them. Upon getting near, shooting near, or shooting at them directly, they'll wake up, give you a brief moment to stop whatever the fuck you're doing and get away. But if you continue to fuck around, you will find out. As this enemy is beyond oppressive, and without good dodging, dodge distance on your weapon, or other strategies to buy yourself time, you're gonna go down. And when you're knocked down, they will instantly kill you before moving on to the next target. Thankfully, they only kill two players before fucking off. They're nothing but a roadblock that should almost never be fought, because even if you can cheese it out through heavy dodge weapons, psyker blocking, or ogre and shield tanking, it has an aura that constantly generates corruption up to just about half your health, which is huge. So that's a lot of heresy, but what do we have to deal with them? Well, had this been prior to October, I would say not much, but now our arsenal is vast. Initially, we only had four different classes with one rigid skill tree with the structure and even the class ideas taken straight from Vermintide 2, where you picked one skill per tier, get one tier of upgrades per five levels, and some of them were honestly quite weak at the start too, but I'll get into how they changed in a moment. First, there's the classes themselves. Veteran is a class who is easily the most overall versatile and easy to use. Since this game leans very much into ranged combat and managing toughness, Veteran's ease of restoring both toughness and ammo without constantly being in melee is great. He also has options for nearly every situation, smoke grenade to shield yourself from any ranged fire, a high damage single target grenade to remove anything you want from existence, including the single toughest non-boss enemy in the game with the crusher, or just staggering and thinning out hordes really well with a massive AoE bleed grenade. They might not be the best at a lot, but depending on how you spec your character, they can be very good at supporting, clearing elites, and being a good mixed melee and ranged brawler, pretty much the starting point of where everything else diverges. Zealot forgoes a lot of ranged bonuses and instead is a heavy melee DPS who can sustain themselves very well, but almost exclusively through the use of melee. They do have some ranged bonuses, since it's still a vital part of the game, but they are sporadic. 
While the other classes also have very high melee damage, easily rivaling Zealot with some finesse, he can do it easier and has access to some of the most powerful abilities in both offensive and defensive. And paired alongside some very powerful cooldown reduction nodes, you can spam these a lot. You either get a massive burst of damage capable of nuking most enemies, almost 10 seconds of pure invincibility for your party, or heavy toughness sustain and easily chained attack speed buff. On top of all that, he can straight up avoid death every 2 minutes and heal up to 25% based on the damage done. He's not the easiest to play in melee, but he still has a good baseline with some very good potential if played right. And that is primarily because Ogryn exists. Ogryn is arguably the undisputed king of melee, which makes sense. I mean, have you seen this motherfucker? He looks like he'd eat an entire underground train because someone suggested he try eating at Subway. While Zealot is very melee focused with all his buffs and abilities, he's still versatile since he has access to nearly every gun the other human classes have and is extremely fast all around. Ogren shares no weapons with them, instead he has his own, which are all extremely powerful but at the cost of speed and handling. All of his melee weapons are so slow that even coming from a Kruber main in Vermintide, it took me so long to get used to the sheer slowness of Ogren. It doesn't help that he is very heavy attack oriented no matter what build you go with, meaning your normal attacks are even slower. With his ranged weapons, almost all of them have long draw times, long reloads, limited capacity, or bad accuracy. Any combination of these really. Ogryn has no jack-of-all-trades comfortable ranged weapons, and that's good, because they are all incredibly fucking powerful for what they do, and a ranged focus Ogryn can pump out some of the highest damage in the game, for all of 10 seconds before he runs out of ammo of course. Even his blitz powers follow this same trend of going all in. Veteran can regenerate his grenades easily, and they're pretty versatile, all things considered. Zealot's blitz usually have a long-lasting effect or have enough capacity to last you a long time. And Psyker's blitz are basically secondary attacks you can use infinitely. But Ogryn? He gets a box you can throw. Two of them, in fact. And when they blow up, they create a gigantic AoE that staggers everything. Or, he can get four rocks that do regenerate, but they're completely single target, do fuck all armor damage, so they're just made to give you an extra ranged option on top of whatever weapon you're using. And also causing some goddamn hilarious ragdolls, I fucking love this rock. And the last option he gets is just a normal grenade. For Ogrins. I don't need to explain why he only gets one. But what you get for dealing with all this is a behemoth who can regenerate almost all of his toughness on a whim in melee, while taking so little damage that sometimes you don't even need to dodge when in melee because you stagger or kill everything with your swings, and any stray hits taken are just instantly recovered. While he might lack the burst of zealot spamming powers or veteran mag dumping, his sustained DPS is extremely high and with absolutely no help from his abilities, which admittedly is good because his abilities suck in comparison. Only one works with guns and causes your ammo to drop faster than your enemies will. One is a light stagger and taunt with nothing else that's special about it making it pretty mediocre. So that leaves you with a charge that's great for mobility and staggering things, but that's about it. It's definitely his best because it also combos well with Ogryn's general tankiness and weakness to range due to his unreliable ranged weapons, since it lets you be anywhere very quickly and never really be trapped. Paired with his ability to continue reviving people despite being damaged, and he's just insanely good all around. Psyker is the opposite end of the spectrum. They are also a powerhouse for much of the same reason. High toughness regen, massive damage that isn't that reliant on abilities, good defenses, strong utility. But Psyker is heavily reliant on playing well. Everything you have to help them survive and deal damage is conditional, and without them, you are incredibly squishy. You fuck up, you're dead. You play well, you can straight up kite bosses endlessly, and take out every enemy like they are nothing. The central gimmick Psychas have, no matter what, is their peril meter. Any warp function they do builds peril, which slowly decays over time and can be manually quelled at no cost, other than slowing down your walking speed. However, if you go over 100% peril, you'll be stunned for a few seconds and explode, causing massive damage to everything and instantly downing you. 
The only way to save yourself is by using a specific ability, or get really lucky on the 10% chance to quell peril on kill passive, where you either kill someone with the damage over time, or the explosion itself triggering it. It sounds dangerous, but it's very easy to avoid with simple management. Plus, it's quite generous since you're given a bit of leeway on what sends you over 100%. If you trigger the main effect of Brain Burst at 99%, you only go up to 100% despite it costing 25%, and you can keep repeating this over and over again. You only explode if you do a warp costing action when you're already at 100%. You can use Peril in a few ways. Either staves, which are ranged weapons that use Peril instead of ammo, weapons with special attacks that use Peril, your Blitz that you always have, or some passives and abilities that scale based on your Peril. All this combined makes them very strong, but unless you spec yourself into a more defensive route, you gotta play well. Especially if you tend to be a melee focus, where a Psyker can pump out some insane damage, but is always at the risk of crumbling immediately if they fuck up. So after going over all that, it sounds like it's a lot more than just one simple set of passes per class. And that's because now, every class gets an entire skill tree to work with that allows you to do whatever you want. You start off with a basic ability, a Blitz Power, an Aura, and every level you get a point to put in this tree. As you go down the tree, you eventually either upgrade your starting ability in Blitz or change them out entirely while also along the way grabbing some really powerful modifiers. And at the end of every tree, there are keystone nodes which grant unique mechanics to round out your build. It looks like a lot to take in for people who don't really theorycraft that much, but this skill tree is set up very well actually. As hinted by some of the art at the top, each skill tree is actually designed so that the leftmost, middle, and rightmost sides are essentially their own specifically designed classes. Let's take Psyker for example. The left side of his skill tree is focused around safely using warp attacks and being able to spam the fuck out of them. Between bonus quell speed, an ability that can save you from blowing up by venting 50% peril, and granting reduced peril generation, you have a lot of room to work with. Then you get a keystone that grants even more peril reduction and a cooldown reduction for even more vent spam if you can kill elites and specials regularly, which is made somewhat easier by the brain burst power that can also be made to cast super fast if you Use your abilities, which, with this keystone, can be spammed really well. To further reinforce the constant warp spam, you are also given toughness on warp kill and when you vent peril. Of course, builds that span across the entire tree is usually the most optimal way, more so for some classes than others, since some choices are much more broadly applicable to every build than sticking with one side. However, the builds they set up by just going down one side of the tree are still very solid. You also get plenty of points to work with, so you can go crazy. I've made a stealth veteran that abuses the hell out of the Laz pistol to move incredibly fast no matter how slow my melee weapon makes me, tossing in some smoke grenades before I uncloak to help me escape as I wreak havoc on the back line. But since I have my gun, blitz, and ability made for this purpose, I don't really have many choices for dealing with heavy armored and bosses. But to fix this, I throw on the Chain Axe while stacking all the weak spot damage Veteran has. With the Specialist Keystone granting you melee attack speed after one ranged kill, I'm kind of scared at just how much damage this Chain Axe can do just by spamming light attacks. Then there's the Never Die Zealot, where you stack 8 wounds as much HP as possible, take a node that reduces the damage something deals if it passes into the next wound, an aura that cleanses corruption up to the next wound, a node where you get huge damage reduction every 10 seconds if you get hit by anything, and if something does manage to finally take you out, you can just heal up to 25% of that already chunky HP. Then, there's Revolver Psycherlot, a build that uses a, the massive crit and headshot potential of the right side of the Psyker tree with the precision of the Revolver and Dueling Sword to abuse the two strongest weapons of the game for unholy amounts of damage if I can constantly land headshots. The lack of peril use and mobility give me so much defense and damage, it's unreal. The passive tree isn't the only element to the equation. Your weapon setup is usually the basis for the build, since the wrong weapon can just make the whole thing not work. Due to the diversity and danger of enemies, you kinda have to build for almost everything. The only reason my stealth veteran build works the way it does is solely because of the chain axe having insane single target damage. Sometimes an idea is only capable due to the weapon blessings as well. When it comes to melee weapons, each character shares most of the same roster, but each of them have a few unique options available to them. For example, Zealot is the only one who can use the Crusher and Thunder Hammers, while Psyker is the only class of the three humans who doesn't have access to the shotgun. One cool change this game makes is that every single weapon has a special action. For guns, they can be pretty boring. It's either some kind of push or a melee that does fuck all damage. Except for this one that does an unholy amount of damage. For seemingly no reason. 
but melee is where they get interesting. A number of melees are given a special attack that often has heavy stagger and can be abused in some interesting combos. Then there are weapons with powered up states like the power sword increasing damage on the next swing or the crusher adding more damage and an AoE stagger. But then you get shit like the revving of the chain weapons which locks you in place for a second while staggering a target and dealing obscene damage. One of my favorites is the Devil's Claw. Not only is it a solid all-around weapon, but it comes with an amazing parry feature where you enter a stance for a second and any attack gets blocked and triggers a very powerful high stagger attack. It's also one of the only three ways that anyone can block overheads from crushers and maulers. And while it's a bit jank, it also counters ragers very hard because a headshot parry staggers them out of their combos. Only downside is if you try and parry a crusher, you have a 0.3 second window to actually land a parry or else the attack gets blocked, but it saps all your stamina and stuns you leaving you open to get ganked. This weapon is so fucking stupid for tanking bosses as well. But the weapons alone don't make the build. As mentioned, each weapon comes with up to two blessings when upgraded. Blessings are modifiers weapons can have that are unique to that weapon class and variant. Many of them are generic damage on kill, damage on hit type of modifiers, but some of them are more out there, like chain weapons applying ungodly amounts of bleed using the special attack, or precision weapons building up crit chance as you aim. The way you can stack these do get pretty crazy. Some weapons really don't come into their own unless you get some solid blessings. My Ogren has this club. On hit, apply a bunch of brittleness, which reduces an enemy's armor, and when hit while staggered, you can make them take more damage. These stack up to twice the value listed, so I can make a crusher go from taking 30 bleed damage to a max of 300 per tick. This only works because of this weapon and Ogren's insane ability to even stagger bosses using this weapon's slap feature. And then you also have my stealth last pistol build being helped a lot by the fact that I can get a stacking close range damage bonus and even more damage if I shoot people in the back. Which does lead me to the part where I start bitching about everything. Alright, the balance just sucks. The vast majority of weapons are absolutely viable, but some blessings just make some already strong weapons even more insane. Not only that, with all the variants of weapons, there's some that just have no reason to exist. Look how much damage the power sword can do with a blessing that gives you two extra powered up swings. Yup, that is three shots on a crusher, and it can also get a blessing that makes it so headshot kills ignore enemy mass. So these powered up horizontal swings can hit an ungodly amount of enemies. Meaning this weapon that was already good and versatile and even having really high block cost at base for some reason, can get the two best blessings in the game. Another example, this is what the Chain Axe does, a weapon that specifically is made to be slow and hard to manage in exchange for single target damage. Or this Thunder Hammer, look at how much damage it does out of the box with just one decent blessing. Now, compare this to a shovel whose only gimmick is folding it, but it's on the Ogren. The Thunder Hammer can potentially do way more, hell it can one shot basically every boss in the game with the right setup, but that requires a very specialized build to pull off and leaves you lacking in other regards. Meanwhile, this is my Ogren build for a shovel one shot on anything that isn't a boss. That's right, it is literally a normal Ogren build, but with this one node I never take otherwise. Sure, that shovel is hella slow, but also remember, it's on fucking Ogryn. Then you have the weird cases like the knife being usable on Psyker while also having the dueling sword, which both do the exact same thing with essentially the same moveset, but the dueling sword is better, and not only that, there's one variant that's just better than everything else. I also feel, in general, weapons with specials that lock you in place are not worth using on higher difficulties. I use the Chain Axe specifically because it does obscene damage without needing to rev it up. Being locked in place for a ton of damage is all well and good, but when you're dealing with a small horde of crushers and it still takes 2-3 to three revs to kill one of them, it's really not ideal. And yes, you can dodge out of it, but it consumes a shitload of stamina to do so, and the damage is heavily backloaded, so unless you fully commit, it's really not worth it. Making weapons clunkier in the name of having them be powerhouses is something this game struggles with balancing. On later difficulties, it's so hectic you pretty much need immediate power. The chain weapons are one thing, but guns also suffer from this. 
The Bolteron launch was obscenely powerful. It did get a lot of nerfs and is still very strong, but it takes years to reload and pull out. Whereas the revolver does the same damage per shot basically, bullets can penetrate entire hordes to find its target, and it can be pulled out instantly. Plus you can also reload one bullet at a time, so while it is slow, you can always have at least one shot ready. It can't do the same crusher or boss mag dumping the bolt gun can, but considering it can still one-shot nearly every special and delete in the game, it's just far too good. And that draw speed makes it even harder to ignore. The next big problem, and what I would argue is the single biggest problem this game has, is the crafting system. It's really bad and does not incentivize all the build crafting and variety that the rest of the game promotes. It also provides poor player feedback and makes them overly worried about numbers that mean a lot less than it seems. The only reliable way to make a weapon is to get a weapon with a good set of base stats, upgrade it twice to get one trait and one blessing. If both are good, continue to orange because you can just replace the second trait and second blessing if it's bad. This is because you can only modify a weapon twice. Either modify two traits, two blessings, or one of each. Doesn't matter. The modifier you change can be infinitely changed, but whatever is locked is done for good. The reason this is a huge pain is that getting blessings to put on guns in the first place is awful. You either find weapons with blessings you want at the end of missions, but that's one weapon at the end of a 30 minute long mission, or you find them from Melk's weekly shop. Other than that, you have to craft those weapons. Grab a random weapon with enough power at base to allow up to tier 4 blessings, level it up to blue quality, and repeat this process until you got the blessing you want. Some, however, are abhorrently rare. This blessing, Bloodthirsty, took me a week straight of constant grinding to get. Keep in mind, I play on Damnation difficulty, which gives you way more materials than even the previous difficulty down. That alone, it takes about 1.5 to 2 hours just to get the resources alone to upgrade the base to max. For one weapon. In a game where each class has a wide variety of weapons. Worst part, 90% of your problems will just be plasteel, due to plasteel being used in higher quantities and is the only ingredient for the first couple of upgrades, with no way to convert the other material into plasteel, so you're just sitting on way more diamanting than plasteel. There's also nothing unique you use diamantine on anyways. Anything that costs diamantine will cost plasteel, so there's essentially only one material in the game. How do you get these weapon bases though? You go to Brunt's Armory. You go in, specify the weapon you want, and just keep hitting that lever until you get a good base stat. It is so laborious to do that people have made mods to automate the process. I also don't like the stat system. The number near the percentages on weapons denotes how many total points the weapon can distribute between the different stats it has listed. It makes the system very granular in a game that focuses on breakpoints more than anything. It doesn't matter if you have 60% damage on the chain axe or 80% damage, if that 20% difference doesn't decrease the number of hits it takes to kill something. But more importantly, it means when buying weapon bases, you can get a lot of shit. You can find a weapon with perfect numbers in every stat, but for some reason, it has only 30% in damage, making it almost worse than a weapon that you can drop when you're level 10. It is uncommon for it to be that bad, but it's still common to have weapons that just have nothing in all of the important stats, while having perfect scores in things like mobility and defense, which just increase your move speed by a small amount and reduce push cost by a small amount. All this does is make people focus on small percents that may or may not even matter, while also making the process of getting a good base weapon to craft really annoying. I get that the weapon power system in Vermintide wasn't exactly amazing, but this is essentially the same system, but far worse. This game also has a lot of problems that just shouldn't be the case. They're fixed with mods. Things like not seeing anyone's HUD while you're spectating, which admittedly was fixed pretty recently. You know, after almost two years. To not knowing how much ammo you get from things. When you make ammo management so important, it's wild. The only way to know how much ammo you got from something is to look at your ammo counter and do math. I don't know about you, but when I play a 40k game, I do it because I want there to be so much shit I don't even have to count. 
The last problem is the monetization. It's really bad. It has a rotating store that changes every two weeks that only sells a handful of cosmetics that may or may not have been something new. They are often sold at ludicrous prices on the backs of some of them being higher quality than other cosmetics, despite often having major clipping issues or bugs associated with them. Like, to get every 40k Rogue Trader promotional cosmetic, it would cost you more than the Rogue Trader game itself. The prices have also steadily increased over time. Bundles have come back with less items and listed at a higher price. The one saving grace is that you can buy items in a bundle separately, so you can save money by buying a chest piece or hat and saving money on pants that often look incredibly generic. Oh, and don't forget using a premium currency that doesn't allow for clean purchases of cosmetics. It was improved after launch, but it's still not great. But, to round all this out, I do have to give a shout out to a very important upside of this game. While I highlighted the music and sound effects as being top notch, god damn the visuals in this game are excellent. The biggest crime this game commits is not having a peaceful difficulty where you can just walk around and take in every detail. With mods I was able to finally sit down and get a good look at all the immaculate detail in these levels, and my god, this game is gorgeous. It may not look the best in terms of raw graphics, but in terms of immersion and detail, there is not a game out there that matches it, save for another 40k game made by an equally cracked out European dev team with Hired Gun and Space Hulk. And they did it for a frantic, constant action FPS where half the time your screen is just covered in heretics or fire. So that's Dark Tide. I went from feeling really lukewarm about this whole thing, but I still saw its potential, and it eventually was able to come into its own and make me absolutely love it. It is definitely a much different flow to Vermintide 2, and I think that's perfect for what it is.